So hey everyone, it's Trevor Turnbull here from Sports Networker, and I'm uh, pleased to be joined today by Kevin Jagger. How's it going, Kevin? Going very well. Thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, no problem. And uh, Kevin, tell everybody where you're sitting right now. <laughs> I'm in uh, Eau Claire Market in Calgary. I'm sitting cross-legged on the floor because my cord wasn't working where I previously was. <laughs> so we needed to find a plug-in, so we got Kevin <laughs> to the closest... Uh, uh, plug in for his computer before it died on us. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, <laughs> all that's good the best now. part about these interviews, though. You can do them from anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so for those of you that don't know who Kevin is, uh, you may not have heard of him before, but you'll definitely hear about him going forward here. Uh, he's a guy who did something um, pretty amazing. I'm going to let him tell his, his story, but he basically went from the corporate world um, to he was an athlete previously and, and went from the corporate world straight into aspiring to uh, uh, skate at the Olympics in long, tra long track speed skating. And uh, with that, Kevin, I'll maybe let you tell your story a little bit. Um, sounds sounds <laughs> good. Going back to, you know, back in the days when you were playing football in McGill. Yeah, so I, uh, I grew up in Vancouver, played football at Vancouver College, uh, went to McGill, played, uh, played some football there, and then basically decided that uh, I was I was not going to be a football star. Uh, I wanted to focus on my school. Uh, I got my finance degree at McGill, went and worked for City um, in Toronto in, in investment banking, and then eventually worked in, in corporate finance at a media company. Um, and when I was uh, watching the Olympics, I, I guess uh, I had a, a lot of close family members uh, tied in with Van Ock, and there was a lot of kind of pressure and build up and and things for you know many years about how great these games were going to be, and I think just watching it getting caught up in um, Canadians being what I thought was kind of very un-Canadian with the whole on the podium thing, and just saying you know we're going to commit the time, we're going to commit them uh, the money, and we're going to do well. It's just it's going to happen, um, and really kind of seeing seeing it happen, um, it just gave me the the idea that you know that that's the idea, that's the plan. If you go out there with a you know a bold plan, commit the resources to it, both. Um, you know, human capital, obviously, and, and financial capital, you can make great things happen. So I kind of looked at it as a 25-year-old at the time saying, I can't believe that's it, that, that I'm done, that I, I'm never going to do a top-level sport again. Nice. Um, so I, I looked into, unfortunately, I wish I had a better story, but I literally went to Wikipedia and looked, uh, printed off the Winter Olympic um, sport list <laughs> and said, uh, no team sports, because I, I figured it was too hard to get, in on, get into that. Uh, nothing that was judged. Um, didn't have the money for, for skiing, uh, and then I had no, no um, existing experience in any of the sledding sports, so I couldn't really, and I played hockey as a kid, so I thought, you know, maybe, maybe speed skating, so I went, I went with speed skating. Nice, nice. So when you say that, uh, you know, there was all this money that was pumped into uh, helping these athletes excel at the 2010 Olympics in Vancouver, um, how did you find it when you finally decided to dive into, uh, you know, taking up this sport of long track speed skating? Was the funding there? Were you able to enter into a program where you had no worries financially? Or, or give us a picture of what that was like. Oh, I, I mean, absolutely not. I think it would be uh, absolutely not. There's no funding for me, and I, I think it would be a huge shame. And you, as a taxpayer, would be probably upset if I was receiving funding. Um, I'm not who this money is dedicated to. It's not meant to, to, to people starting at the bottom late in the stage. I mean, these are the funds should be directed at 16, 17, 18 year old, 19 year old kids uh, that have kind of proven their potential. Uh, for me, I was going to be operating outside of the system, which was totally fine with me. Um, and I, I find there is, I would, I would kind of say, adequate funding. And speed skating is a, a well funded sport um, where the athletes are, they're not. Um, they're not starving. Uh, I mean, they're they're getting. They've got quality. I mean, we have world class facilities, world class coaches. Yeah. Um, it's that extra little bit. It's speed skating is a sport where you're you're there for 10, 15, 16 years, and it's it's speed skating Canada's job maybe to to kind of get skates on your feet, get you to competitions, get you obviously you know the old adage of kind of shelter over your head and you know clothes on your back. They do a fantastic job of that. But I think it's it's a lot on the athletes um, to make a living out of it. They athletes complain that I, I mean they come out of these sports in, in massive debt. But if you were to ask them kind of what they'd done specifically um, to to help their own financial situation, I, I think you'll see there's there's obviously varying answers there. And the ones that have gone out and pounded the pavement have, have done well. Hmm. 
You mean, do you mean in the sense of going out and actually securing their own sponsorship as, Se as an athlete? Securing additional personal sponsorships. Um, okay. So, so like I said, Speed Skating Canada is well funded, but it is not in the situ it's not in the situation where I, I from again I'm looking out. I'm not funded or a part of Speed Skating Canada. Um, well, I don't you're, see. You're currently not part of Speed Skating well, Canada, it's, like it's, under the same financing or the I'm funding. Not, I'm not sure where the the umbrella of Speed Skating Canada starts and stops. I term it the national team. So the national and the national and all any carded athlete. Um, Speed Skating Canada, I'm, I'm a part of the Oval program. I'm not sure if it's where their relationship is with Speed Skating Canada. Obviously, Speed Skating Canada has some sort of oversight. Um, but when I mean Speed Skating Canada, I mean our, our, our Olympians, the names you've heard of, the skaters you've heard of, uh, our carded athletes. Right. Um, they, you know, it, like I said, it, it's a, it's a well, it's a well-funded sport comparative to other winter sports. But, um, and some of our, our speed skaters have done very well securing personal um, sponsorship, but others have, have struggled. Right. So this is where your story gets to, uh, to be quite interesting and obviously an inspiration. And the reason why I wanted to interview you on this is because you're kind of paving a path here. Um, whether you like to believe it or not, you are paving a path here in defining how amateur athletes can go about securing their own sponsorship and tying in new technology to add value to those potential sponsors. Um, you left a job that was obviously paying, paying you quite well, um, yep. that you know you could have potentially just kept on that career path, but when you decided to go and be an athlete uh, and aspire to these Olympic dreams, um, what's, what was going through your head as far as like how can I build some awareness, get people rallying behind me, uh, secure the funds needed for you to essentially just pick up and go and start training in, uh, in the facilities in Calgary? I guess the, uh, the number one thing was uh, I knew that I would have a unique story and something that would be that there would be some people interested in following, um, and that with that following, um, just understanding how con con online content works, there's the value associated with it. So if I can produce content, um, and I'm obviously ideally exclusive content, which is run through my blog, and there's a following attached to it, I now have an asset. I can't go to a sponsor and say, you know, I am. X ranked speed skater because that's not going to impress anybody whatever my, my ranking is mm -hmm. um, and instead I go with a story that no longer compares me to anybody else they have to look at me and decide yes that's something we want to sponsor and there's no way to be like okay well hold on we've heard your story let's get nine other speed skaters in here and we'll compare the stories I've by by sharing my story I've eliminated that mm -hmm. and I've made it you know would you like to be kind of a part of my story and I think that's what other states, other athletes can do, is if if you're if you're just results and that's your pitch, you better be the best in the world. Mm -hmm. um, because if you say, you know, I'm seventh in Canada, if I'm a sponsor, I'd be like, okay, well, show me the other six guys. Like, why well, I want to talk to the other guys. Right. Right. Whereas, whereas if you come in with this, you know, I'm a former hockey player, had a lot of injuries, I transferred to speed skating. Um, I'm from X hometown. You've now crafted your story in a way where they're like, okay, we're talking to you, and that's we're now going to base our decision on whether you have, you know, something we want to be aligned with. Right. So, so, so it's almost less about uh, sponsoring and affiliating themselves with you as an athlete, more around you as an individual that happens to be an athlete that's trying to excel in this sport. Right. I, I'm on the extreme case. I'm. I lead further to the story side of things than athletes probably need to. Right. It, it's it's more of an example. Is you can you can understand that I can generate value without results. So nothing to take away from being the seventh ranked speed skater in Canada, which is a phenomenal ranking. Just it can't just be it. The same way I can't get away with no results. I'm gonna I need results to back up the story. Right. I'm saying if you're going to rely wholly, wholly on results, you better be number one. And um, if you're not number one, you can't. You need to add a little flavor and um, and make it kind of kind of a no-brainer for a sponsor and be like, figure out what their goals are out of a sponsorship, hit them with you know what the things you bring to the table that are different, mm -hmm. and that's that's kind of it. I and again, I don't. My my situation is a little bit unique. I don't think. Um, people should just be focusing on their on their story and their pitch. I mean, you need to focus on being a speed skater, right? right. Athlete, right? Yeah. So, can you give us an example of some of the creative ways that you've been using your websites and these social tools to to provide value to sponsors and 
and essentially go out and give your pitch and and uh, offer them something in return? For sure. One of the one of the things that I think is great about amateur athletics is sponsors. It's not a it's not a ridiculous far flung element of your training. You ask any amateur athlete if they sit down for a beer with someone. Probably by the time they get to the third or fourth question, they ask, "How do you pay for this? How are you getting funded?" Mm-hmm. It's it's a great way for a sponsor to organically become a true part of your story. Um, and I mean, everyone remembers something going back to like Rick Hansen that you know he, he had Nike and McDonald's. You always remember it. It's you can't that that journey couldn't have happened without that. And they kind of infuse themselves into that story. Mm-hmm. You don't need to be you don't need to be on a path of that magnitude to have the same effects. And so I think what athletes can offer is, like I said, it's organic. It's very much part of your story. Um, and for a lot of sponsors, it's local kind of grassroots engagement where um, I think my sponsors look for a number of things. One, they genuinely want to help. Uh, they're just great. I'm very fortunate to have a kind of a great group of supporters that are kind of fans first. Yeah. Two, um, I'm, they're all around my community, so when I host events or have a going away party or have a year-end fundraiser, um, I'm always able to either, if I can include their services or um, able to have uh, a lot of my supporters um, support me by buying t-shirts. And so the sold about 500 t-shirts all in the Vancouver area pretty much that have all my sponsors on it. So people are going to the gym uh, and working out in, in the shirt of you know my sponsors in the area that my sponsor operates. Right, right. Um, yeah, and so when I send out, I send out, um, you know, I've sent out a ton of thank you cards, a simple thing. It's a, a little postcard. And again, it, it's going to the various, I mean, I send them out, I sent out about 800. Um, they all have my sponsor's logos on it, and they're all going to people in those key demographics. They're not, it's not totally unrelated. Right. Um, so it, it's just kind of that grass local engagement. Um, and like I said, it's a key part of my story, so it's very easy for me to continually bring up my sponsors. Yeah. Well, I know we talked about this uh, just a few minutes before we got onto this interview here too, talking about the the idea of working with clients and without having the goal of trying to get them a hundred thousand likes on a fan page, right? It's not right. about the volume; it's more about the quality of the types of people that you have interacting with your brand. And I think that's what you're speaking to on the sponsorship side of things: is that you're in the community. These people are sponsoring you um, genuinely because they want to see you succeed, but also because you align with them um, in more than just trying to give them the max- maximum exposure, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and that's what I think is, is key for athletes. If I went out, I probably would have got their funding once as, a, as what I would call it basically a donation. But I mean, if you're an athlete, you're committed to a multi-year thing. A donation, it's not a sustainable model. You need to be adding value. And if you're adding value, and, and it's seen, I mean, even if you can make that donation, the more and more you carve that into the marketing side of things, in the marketing budget, you have a much higher likelihood of renewing that sponsorship each year. Mm-hmm. Um, and that allows you to commit to your goal. If each year I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to have my money next year. How do you train? How do you wake up and, and go train hard knowing that, I mean, it's like going to work thinking you're going to get fired the next day yeah um, your, your mind's racing whereas um, having these little things and I mean little kind of contests through social media and, and one of my sponsors is the Mac Shack and doing um, you know we've got a plan uh, blog post of you know going in and going into the restaurant and, you know trying the meal out that's a little thing and it doesn't need to have a million views on YouTube for it to be very um, impactful in, in the in the key demographic it's something that you know Mac Shack is uh, about four blocks from my old high school, a lot of my followers on on my blog are all Bank of College alumni. Right. It does. It's not very hard to tie that all in um, and have a very um, strong kind of ROI on the sponsorship. Um, when we're not talking big dollars and we're not talking big views. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you you uh, reference the fact there too of of trying to work these deals in a way where, like for you, for example, you've got what three years of training until the next Olympics, right? Two, two yeah. and a half years of training, two, essentially. Two and a half. Um, were you able to, in your agreements with sponsors, be able to secure um, some of those sponsors throughout the duration of all this training then? Or, or yeah. how do you structure those? The majority of my sponsors are committed committed to the end. Um, so we set up annual goals each, um, each year. 
Yeah. And um, the idea is that, you know, I, I'm basically trying to buy myself more time by hitting my goals. And so we achieved last year's goals. I held a sponsor reception, which was a small, um, a small night out basically with my sponsors and just kind of away from the blog and away from me, um, you know, sending things out to the, to the, the readers and followers. It was able to speak to a group of about 18 people and just say, you know, this is exactly what I'm thinking. This is where my head's at. This is how I'm feeling come out of this first season. Yeah. And the goal of that night was to basically get a get a, a, a feel for how people were feeling about the future and then basically was able to renew the majority of those sponsorships, actually all those sponsorships that night. Oh, cool. um, so they're, they're committed. They're long-term. They're all, I mean, fantastic people that, are, like I said, are – our sports fans first, and um, by me uh, working to recognize their sponsorship, I think it's just making it easier and easier that, for them to say yes each year. So when you say uh, meeting your goals, are you are you referring to uh, training goals? Or are you referring to like, actual performance goals of like traffic on your websites and? No, no, that's all. That's all cherry on on the Sunday uh, time. This is speed skating specific goals. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so that's all. Um, yeah, this this is a. I mean, this is a speed skate. I'm. I mean, that's that was a big thing to kind of communicate to people here in Calgary too. Was that um, I'm not doing this as a side as a side project. The blog really did come through. To be honest, the blog originally started as a way for my coach and I to share video. We couldn't send email videos back and forth. Right. So I would put up a video clip and write a description, and then I was like, oh, you know what? My parents are probably wondering what I'm doing because right. I quit. I quit my job to go speed skate. And it was four months after I quit my job that I first put on speed skates. So I was, you know, I knew there was a lot of close people that were wondering if I'd maybe lost my mind. Um, so I wanted to share it with immediate friends and family. And then they started commenting and, and sharing it. And then it kind of grew from there. And now, I mean, now it's been in over uh, um, 108 countries. And, uh, the blog has wow. really been, my line on it is 12, when I was 12 months into this journey, I, I could not have done it uh, without the blog. If I did not have the blog, I it would have been, um, I would have been dead in the water. I think. Yeah, well, it's it's an awesome story, and you've actually um, spun this off into a business as well, right? Like you, you mentioned yeah. that you train in the mornings to to work around the schedule of these these young guys and gals that you're skating with, and yeah, it's, um, and then work a regular or run a business, I should say, not work a job. You're actually running your own business during the day as well. Is that that's right? I that, yeah, that's correct. And so that's. That's where I'm meeting with a lot of athletes now. Um, on my side of things, my goal with sponsorship, which is the goal for a lot of people, uh, is, um, is, is cost coverage. I basically have a, 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 a cost for the year, um, and I, I'm very, I mean, I'm public with that with my sponsors, and I say, this is where the use of proceeds is going, um, and we're close to covering it each year, and then any default on that is, um, you know, I didn't feel comfortable kind of calling them back and and kind of reneging on the original deal. So I started to do a little bit of work on the side using some of the social media tools that I had learned um, that I knew were applicable to more than amateur athletics. So mm -hmm. um, some, of my, some of my sponsors and, and uh, had put me in touch saying, you know, Kevin had done a good job recognizing their contribution and that some of the tools might be applicable in their business. So meeting with them, discussing their social media and digital marketing goals, uh, I was able to kind of sign on with them and I've now picked up, um, you know, almost... I mean, almost a dozen um, clients that I that I manage their social media and digital marketing efforts online, and um, that has been a great for me because it allows me to. Um, it, I mean, it allows me to basically kind of provide for a lot of the, the things that are outside speed skating that I didn't that I don't include in my sponsor packages that I don't think they should have have to pay for anyways. Mm -hmm. So you know, flights home if I want to fly home and surprise my girlfriend, um, you know, I got to work for a while to get that money, but that's not something I would send to my sponsor. Right. Um, but when, I mean, we we have a, a thing of, you know, um, new skates and, and uh, skating related travel costs. Um, it wasn't going to be sustainable if I, if I couldn't, um, get that covered. I mean, kind of be irresponsible as a, as a 25 year old, 26 year old. Um, you know, if I, I kind of burnt through a lot, a lot of, you know, a lot of money by the time I'm 30 and done with this. Mm -hmm. And see, that's that's what I think a lot of skaters face, and there a lot of the younger ones are relying on are relying on parents, and I think that's a great way to get started with this stuff, where there's not the pressure of the big dollar amounts that you have to commit to. Just find a sponsor, find honestly, they're worried about the dollar amount. Find a dollar amount 
you're comfortable with as the athlete. You know, right. what, what, what amount do you think you could deliver on? If, if, I, sign, if I did a, you know, a, a ten dollars or $15,000 deal, that'd be hanging over my head every day uh, to make sure they're getting their value out of it. Right, yeah. So that leads well into this next question then. If you were to give advice to any of these younger skaters or even um, uh, some younger people that are aspiring to get into the skating world, um, what would that tip be as far as like from a personal branding perspective? What's the first steps that they should start with? Um, I mean, the biggest thing is to, call, is to, to just recognize that um, there are people interested in this and that even though this is something you're doing daily, um, it, it is interesting. It's, it's an interesting way of life, being an athlete full time. And I, the old adage on, on Twitter is oh, like, no one wants to follow you on Twitter because no one wants to know what you had for lunch today. <laughs> right. it, for, for athletes, that really is something that people do want to know. Um, you know, when you're at Starbucks and you want a snack. What's the healthiest thing there? Those are things that people struggle with. And an athlete, they make those decisions all, all day, every day, of, of living kind of that extreme healthy life mm -hmm. and active life. Whereas people that don't necessarily have that time, they are interested. in, in And so... Don't think that um, you know having a small Twitter following, a small um, you know Facebook fan page or blog, um, it means it's not going well. Um, you know if you have some some followers and some people that are paying attention, honestly, even if it's just your family, um, that's how it all starts. You got to start somewhere, right? Yeah, and the biggest thing I find is people start the blog um, and they're like, "Oh, I haven't got any sponsors yet," um, or they. They don't know how to, or they start just firing it out, and it's pitch, 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 pitch. They're asking everyone. Mm -hmm. What I have, what I have found is, I'm amazed at each blog post I send out. It's almost like it's a very cool feeling when you push publish on it, and you're just like, I don't know where this is going to go. I have no idea whose inbox this is going to get forwarded to, and what's going to come of it. And it's just that hanging around the hoop theory of publishing more content. And being kind of open and honest and continually sharing your story, right. people people get onto it and people want to help you. Mm -hmm. People really do want to help. Definitely. And I think one of the things that I've noticed with you is consistency too. You make a point of trying to share things, even if, as insignificant as you might think that they are, um, other people might find them interesting. I know following you and some of your training routines, I think you blogged recently about um, not being comfortable in the past um, sharing your fitness or your workout tips because you kind of wanted to get into the swing of things first and, right? and then be able to share some insights based on what you had learned and, and the progress that you were making and we'll obviously see that evolve but uh, I think that's a really important part is that to just be consistent even if you're starting out um, with not a whole lot to say uh, as long as you're saying something, as long as you're putting for something out there. For sure and I think uh, that's something I learned a long time ago interviewing for jobs there's nothing wrong with saying you don't know, mm -hmm. and there's nothing worse than saying you know when you don't know. <laughs> so I'm not big on nutrition. You won't see me, I, I, not that I'm not big on it, it's not an expertise of mine. Mm -hmm. And so what you were alluding to is I was hesitant to post videos saying, you know, this is a, um, we have imitations in speed skating, it's a type of speed skating drill. I was very hesitant to post a video because my entire story is about not knowing anything about right. this sport, so it's very disingenuous. And that's a great way for me to lose a lot of followers and a lot of credibility. People would be like, that's not how you do that. Like, right. what do you, whereas I'm kind of a lot more open saying, here's the video. I'm not doing it from a, this is how you do it. I'm doing, this is where I'm at. Right. This, yeah. this is what I was told to do and this is where I'm at. So I try and critique it as best I can and send it around to the people I know. But if I'd originally approached that with uh, this is how you do it, this is great. I, I um, you know, you, you end up in trouble that way. But yeah. the, the the other side of that is if you are strong in, in uh, nutrition, write about it. Become kind of the thought leader in whatever it is that you think you're you know, particularly good at. Share that and that's where you'll attract a strong, a strong following. And that the thing is in the beginning, what you might be an expert on is your story. So leave it at that. Yeah. And, yeah. and share it. Share your story until maybe that's kind of my advice on that. The other, sorry, the one other piece that I'll, I'll see that, I, that a lot of athletes that kind of have blogs, uh, the big thing is you go check their blog page and it's, um, you know, the last blog is after their most recent gold medal finish and the blog before that is their most recent world, world championship. Mm -hmm. Blog about the bad days. Mm -hmm. Blog about a, a double false start and what was going on and why that happened because it gives people context 
I hate it when I, I mean, I've had to write about losing a race to a, you know, a teenage girl and I'm, I'm so thankful that I wrote it. The next time I have a little win, like a little victory, it's so much better to be able to link, you know, to be like, oh, just a, you know, here, heads up, here's a, here's a video <laughs> six weeks ago. It provides a little context. Yeah. And it really gives people the ability to appreciate the win with you. No Whereas doubt. if I kind of, if I kept everything in, it's hard if everyone just assumes everything's going great. It's yeah. hard for people to be, you know, champion for you. Yeah. No, it's people are definitely more vested, have more, more of a vested interest when they, they uh, go along for the ride with you through the highs and the lows, don't they? Yeah. And they can really appreciate the highs. No doubt. And uh, the one other thing that I've noticed here, too, and this is just in um, taking a look at your Facebook pages, aside from the sponsorship stuff, as an athlete, um, you know, reaching out and getting support and advice from other athletes, I think, is a real boost, especially from an amateur athlete perspective. Like uh, Apollo Ono reached out to you yeah. on Twitter, did he not? Yeah, yeah, no, he did. And that, that is a big, um, that's a, I mean, I know Twitter has affected a lot of in industries and social media has Twitter specifically. I don't think uh, I, uh, amateur athletes has got to be up there with the most impacted um, by Twitter because your whole deal is to share your story. And up until then, you just had to hope that your local news, stick, news um, covered you. Yeah. And if they didn't, no one knew who you were. No one knew anything about you. So this empowers you to share your own story. But the, the other side of that is to what you were alluding to is, is one, you can reach out um, to specific people. And so if you don't know what's going on on um, you know, a speed skating thing, it's great for me to, to find someone on Twitter and send them a link and say, you know, what do you think? Mm -hmm. What's going on here? <laughs> what's, yeah. what's going wrong? Why isn't this working for me? So it was great for Apollo um, to, to reach out to me and you know, he'd given me some feedback on my slide board work. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really neat thing and, and it's just great for the sport. It's great for, um, you know, that's something that I take and share and it just reflects well on the sport that you've got a, you know, an eight-time medalist um, active, active in the speed skating community and, yeah. and um, you know, taking the time to talk to some guy who's been in the sport for, I think at that time, about 60 days. <laughs> right. Well, it's a cool story. I know uh, I'm enjoying following your your route to the Olympics here and who knows where it's going to end up you know it's not even so much about even being on the podium I think as much as it is about the journey that you're on right now um, but I wish you the best of luck I hope that everything works out for you uh, and you go and get that gold medal for Canada <laughs> I really appreciate it thanks yeah. for so uh, last thing how can people find you online how can they connect with you uh, the, the, uh, I mean, one of the great ways is Twitter so at Kevin Jagger um, and then the blog is longtracklongshot.com and uh, the Facebook fan page is facebook.com slash longtracklongshot. Okay, perfect. And I'll link that up below this video here too so that you guys can all connect with Kevin. And uh, yeah, thanks again for doing this, man. And uh, go grab some lunch in the food court there. It looks like <laughs> they turned the lights off on you in the background. Yeah, I know. I'm getting, I'm getting some dirty looks now. <laughs> <laughs> all awesome. right. Thanks a lot, Kev. Thanks, Trevor. Cheers.